The Bible is the most abused book of all time. This might not sound like a big deal, but misinterpreting scripture results in the destruction of families, stolen lives, and the destruction of souls. Roman Catholics state that wafers and wine literally are transformed into the body and blood of Christ during communion. The prosperity gospel preachers posit that all Christians should be healthy and wealthy if they name it and claim it and just simply have enough faith. Cults like the Latter-day Saints and the Jehovah's Witnesses were founded from twisting scripture out of context. Even well-meaning Christians can abuse scriptures as well. We know that Satan himself quotes scripture when he tempted Christ in the wilderness. How is it that people can take the same Bible verses and come up with entirely different interpretations from one another? Well, join us on this episode of Stop and Think About It. Hello? Hello, anybody home? I don't think, McFly, think. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. What were you thinking? I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Don't say anything now. Just think about it. You're listening to Stop and Think About It, a podcast for the Christian thinker. In a day when sound biblical preaching has been replaced by man-centered entertainment and the church has become increasingly anti-intellectual, this podcast will encourage believers to think biblically and theologically. So please join me as we get ready to stop and think about it. Come on, Greetings, friends and foes, saints and sinners. Welcome to part two of Twisted Scripture and Christian Cliches. I have with me this morning, Steve, the Brooklyn Berean. How you doing, Steve? I'm good, thank you. We have Glenn Roy, the West Indian wordsmith. Glenn, greet everyone. Hey, everybody. And I'm your host, Phil, the sensei. Well, listen, I'm like the furthest thing from what you would call a car guy. I like cars. I can do basic things like change a tire, jump start a battery. But when I lift up the hood of a car, there's a whole lot of things going on there that I'm not familiar with, and it's a complete mystery to me. But when a mechanic looks under the hood of my car or any car, he's familiar with what he's looking at and uses tools to help him judge what's what and what the problem might be and is able to figure out a solution. And when we look under the hood of the Bible and look into the scriptures, what tools should we use and what should we look for to rightly interpret the word of God? So on this episode, what I want to do is before we dive into looking at other verses and passages and how many people twist them out of context, just as we have all done in the past ourselves and Christian cliches that we've put up like a poster child and we've butchered those things to death. We want to look at three steps of biblical interpretation. Of course, there can be more than three steps. There can be steps within these steps. But the three steps of biblical interpretation are as follows. So number one, investigation. And all of these are going to start with an I because I like alliteration. And alliteration is very important because all you have to do is remember there are three letters and they all start. There are three words that all start with the same letter. So number one, again, investigation. So you want to play detective with the text. Steve mentioned in the past episode in part one, the three rules of interpretation, context, context, context. And what, what was the third rule? Reason? Context. <laughs> <laughs> and that's wow, this important. is hard. There you go. So that is one of the things, uh, context thrice, as some might say. But another aspect is genre. What type of book are you reading? Is it historical? Is it literary? I mean, yes. Is, is it, it like poetic? Po- yeah. po- Proverbs is not the same as Psalms. Well, genre is important because if we read the Bible according to its genre, we'll better understand it. You hear a lot of people say, no, I read the Bible literally. Well, why is that problematic? If you read the Bible literally, we're going to have a lot of guys walking around with a missing eye and a missing hand. When Jesus said, pluck it out and cut it off, he wasn't speaking literally. Right? He was using figures of speech. So there's different genres in the Bible that we read differently. So if you read literally Revelation, as one commentator said, you're going to either have a very large woman or seven very small hills. Right, right. And then, you know, what's funny about that is if people took literally gouge your eye out because you're using it to lust, you would just use the other eye to lust. <laughs> and brothers, <laughs> how, how do we mortify the flesh? I'm still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, what can't do, you, do it literally. Would you jump in the fire? I mean, what would you do? And in history, people have done that. Um, 
one of the famous church fathers uh, castrated himself. Oof. Now, now, what's that po- the policy of beating yourself with the... Is it's, that fl- uh, flagellation or yeah. something like that? Yeah. So, flagellation. Flagellation. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, think about that. I mean, do we should we all be doing that? No. According to the Bible. No. No, you pick up a flagellation. Uh, well, it says a whip on put me, to we- death the deeds of the flesh. Right. Yes. Right. Right. It's not, it's, it's not literal. The deeds. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But you can. You can read it that <laughs> way if you spirit. want to. And I, I know people who do that. It's a way to be legalistic where the Bible is not intending that. Yeah. So uh, to Steve's point, it's crucially important because if you interpret something by the wrong genre, I mean, you can do damage, physical damage to yourself. You could screw up your church. You can mess up a lot of people in your life. Right. And and then going back into this context, right? Who, what, where, when, why, how? When is it? Who? I think the, and we're going to do this a lot. Who is it referring to solves a lot of problems. Yeah. And who's writing it? Mm -hmm. When are they writing it? Like Mm -hmm. what's happening at the time? Is it war? Is it peace? Are they up in a mountain? Are they down in the valley? Mm -hmm. Are they a king or a shepherd? I mean, all of these things matter. And sometimes you might already know these things. Mm -hmm. You might have uh, not preconceived ideas, but prerequisite knowledge. Did I say that right, Glenn? Mm -hmm. Prerequisite knowledge. And so you might know when you're reading uh, the the Psalms that David was a shepherd. Mm -hmm. And so what's the most famous Psalm? Psalm 23. 23, and it starts out, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, it's interesting to know that David was a shepherd. Right, right. So we don't want to belabor the point, but um, basically uh, you want to decide what words you might want to look up. So you might want to circle words and underline things. They look this Especially up. Especially if up. you read the J- KJV like me. it's a I have to have a dictionary handy. Absolutely. Hither henceforth, brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I stick with the ESV, the Lex Standard Version. Steve, which version do you read? ESV and NASB. I okay. do not read any non uh, King James versions. There you go. There you go. Well, we're going to get you to the Lex Standard Version <laughs> maybe one day. We're we're still no, nothing wrong with those old versions. To repent. All right. Um, and then maybe you want to look up some cross references, verses that you know connect with the verse that you're looking at or the passage. Uh, you're why looking is at. that important, Phil? What? is the best tool for interpreting scripture. So think about a diamond. What's the best thing that can cut a diamond? A another, diamond. Another diamond. Uh, uh, another diamond. Yeah, there you go. Late to the party, but you got there. <laughs> <laughs> Take me, it takes me a while. It, it's okay. A little slow, but wor- 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 worth waiting for. <laughs> so scripture interpret scripture just like a diamond can only cut a diamond. And so we're using cross-references, um, you know, and of course, it's verses that you know, your, your familiarity with the Bible. So some people know more verses than others. So when they read a passage of scripture, it's kind of like playing connect the dots. And I love that. It brings you from one verse to the next. And so what happens when we, we come across a scripture that seems hard to understand? Because Peter said that our brother Paul, his letters, he writes things that are hard to understand that the unlearned twist to their own destruction. So... The Bible is easy to read, but that doesn't mean everything is easy to understand in it. So when you come across passages that might be hard to understand, we need to look to the other passages that speak about that, that are more plain and simple to understand to determine the meaning of the text. Uh, So scripture interprets scripture, the more clearer scriptures help us understand the more difficult passages. And and now I know argument I've heard is... Well, it's circular reasoning. You're using the Bible to, to prove the Bible. But we do that in every sphere of life. A physics teacher, they have to use the same terms. They have to make sure one physics law applies to the other physics law. And so anything we do, you have to at least understand the terms. And so the only way to do that is to say, okay, is this consistent with everything else that I've read? Yeah, because in, in math, don't you use proofs yeah. to prove things? It's a proof. So yeah. would you say you can't use mathematical equations to show that mathematical equations work? You have to. That's the <laughs> only way to prove that mathematical equation. You, you establish facts and you say, okay, clearly God, Jesus is saying this here. Right. And so he can't be contradicting himself five verses later. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and we're going to look at one verse that people may think actually does that from the very lips of Jesus himself. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to keep you hanging on right now so that we uh, we won't we won't bring that out uh, to the forefront. So once again, that's investigation, right? That's playing detective. Investigation, playing detective is the New Testament quote in the Old Testament. So in other words, the book of Psalms is often quoted, and I believe the most quoted 
uh, Old Testament book in the New Testament is something in the Old Testament revealed more fully or clearly in the New Testament. And we're going to see that in some of the verses that we handle in future episodes. Yes. Where an Old Testament passage is not clear. But now the New Testament sheds light on it and gives more clarity to the meaning of the old. So if you just read the old, you wouldn't get the full picture. But the New Testament takes the Old Testament passage and it opens it up and it sheds light on it to give us better understanding. Is this a cliche, Glenn? In the Old Testament, the New Testament is concealed. In the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed. People don't say it enough to make it a cliche yet. Okay. So there you go. I, I mean... Just to to finish it out, but um, we know you didn't make that up. <laughs> no, I didn't make that up. I I can't remember where they came from. Steve, do you remember? He no. doesn't remember either. So basically, think somebody about much it. smarter than ourselves uh, came up with that. <laughs> exactly. So think about it. Just just an aside. I haven't had an original thought in like ten years. <laughs> that is the most original thing I've ever heard you say. <laughs> so when you start off with Matthew, it goes through these old genealogies. You know, begat, 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 son of, son of, son of. You're lost. You have to refer back to the Old Testament to find out who David is, who who um, Rahab was, who who Boaz was. It, you, you you have to do that, and we're not saying you you got to sp- you might have to spend a lot of time on the investigation. I think this is the part that people miss a lot. So I think um, you know sometimes we don't really look at the scripture enough and really examine what's there for us to learn and we just jump to a commentary and say what does macarthur think you know and whoever your favorite commentator is uh, what do they think steve and, and what's the problem with that now you're embracing a view that somebody else did to study and you're not coming to your own conclusion of what the passage means I'm- so i go to commentaries a lot. I use them extensively. Amen. But I'll read the text. I'll go through it. I'll outline it. I'll write it out. I'll, I'll meditate on it. And then when I see something, I'm like, wow, I didn't see that before. I'll write it down and I'll think, wow, I got this really awesome thing I heard nobody say. Well, I go to commentaries and like every other commentator said this already. So it's not, <laughs> so we're not looking for anything new in the text. Right. But we're trying to come to the meaning of the text by studying ourselves so that we are learning what the text means. And then if we go to commentators and they're saying the same thing, pretty much we're safe and in the ballpark. But now R.C. Sproul said it. If you come to an interpretation that no other person in, in the last 2,000 years has come to, it's a good idea to abandon that interpretation. I jump think, off the, jump off the train tracks at that point. Because yeah. y- you want to make sure that you're like on the train tracks. So, but again... I would push the commentaries aside initially, just investigate that. Is it a prophecy in the Old Testament fulfilled in the New, like Isaiah 7, 14? Behold, a virgin will be child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. According to Matthew 1, 22 to 23, the prophecy was fulfilled in Mary. She is called a virgin in Luke 1, 27. A virgin shall be with child. Is this a type? What's a type? It's a picture. It's 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 representing something else. Yes, and so, for instance, there are types and shadows in the Old Testament, such as the sacrifice of Isaac, when Abraham. Well, he wasn't sacrificed, but Abraham was planning on sacrificing his own son when he was told by an angel, and that points to the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Jonah was in the fish for three days and three nights. Yes, I went to Jonah again prefiguring the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then here's where Glenn is uh, keen on, the literary types. What are literary types, Glenn? Yeah, so hyperboles, similes, metaphors, you know, how we combine things. All the stuff you hated in English class 101, now you need it. What about if I speak with the tongues of angels? Correct. It's hyperbole. It's, it's, it's just to say it's, it's a language no man knows. Right. Period. He's right. not making a point that there's some angelic language out there that some people know. Right. Why? What, what's the main reason? Where else in the Bible does it mention that? Nowhere. Nowhere. Right. And we speak human language. We don't speak angelic language. Uh, so you mean Joel Olstein wasn't correct when he said that Joseph's brothers threw him into the pit? No. And so Judah is the one that kind of tried to save him from death. But Judah's name means praise. praise. So when you find yourself in the pit, you praise your way out. That works. I think that's textbook misapplication of scripture. <laughs> that's heresy. <laughs> yeah, watch when, when Joel Osteen lands in a pothole. 
or his driver yeah. <laughs> lands in a pothole. But, but think about that. Now, if you're studying and you, you come up with that and you search everywhere in every comment and you never heard that said before, don't you think it's a good idea to abandon that and say- exactly. I'm coming up with something that nobody else ever saw. The, so to, to say that, you know, I was studying and the Holy Spirit showed me something that all other commentators missed. Yeah, so like when the Titanic was going down, people jumped in the lifeboats because the ship was going down. So like when your interpretation is going down, jump in the lifeboat, get out of the way, let the ship sink, hmm. humble yourself, <laughs> Yeah, you, and you, be safe. <laughs> you thinking that's what God wants is not a good criteria. You thinking, well, it makes sense to me is not a good criteria. The criteria has to be, does it make sense biblically? So just going back to what you were saying before, Phil, when we began, these are like mechanics tools. They are, they're, they're the parts that make up the written words. They're the engine, so to speak. So God, God inspire these men to write these things so we would read them and so everything that's there is is supposed to help aid us and so we now can't just be like how phil says he doesn't know what to think about cars we have to know what god is trying to say we have to figure it out that's our mandate and so we when we look at the bible have to be mechanics so let's move to part two here second step interpretation so when in step one when you were investigating and you said i want to look up these words now in step two you actually look them up Mm -hmm. you can use a concordance you can use bible dictionaries there are some online you can go to different websites and then commentaries will have these types of things too now's the time where you can use some commentaries any recommendations on any commentaries that you guys frequent john gill John Gill. Because he stays in the KJV. Ah, we do like John Gill. You a John Gill fan, Steve? Um, I read Not on everything. John Gill. Not on everything, but I think he's solid in certain things. He's good. He's He like he makes a beeline to the gospel mm-hmm. like constantly. Mm-hmm. I use him when I preach on Jonah just to make sure I stayed in the ballpark. The Pillar New Testament commentary series is very good. Gotcha. Uh, the um, NIV application commentary series is very good. Mm. NIV stands for the non-inspired version? Yes, but the, uh. the, actually the commentary <laughs> has some good uh, gotcha. uh, volumes in there. And, and, and we got to remember sermons. Sermons are, 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 are just oral commentaries in, in some respects. That's true. Good a, good, a good website to go to for commentaries is bestcommentaries.com. And they list the commentaries of the best commentaries rated by book and by volume. Um, and they're usually very good. Yeah. So best commentaries. And chalice.com and ligonier.com also shows the five top commentaries of each book of the Bible, at least according to their own views. And and, and, and wouldn't you say you should also have, and use a variety. I mean, I say John Gill and that's one I have, but have a bunch because you, what you said is one of the tools is, am I on the ballpark? So you want to get some people that you're critical of? Some people that you like usually side with, and then someone in the middle where you're you're you off and on because you just want to know where you are in the ocean. Am I near Jamaica? Or am I near America? Yeah, yeah. One thing very important about commentaries: there are different kind of commentaries. You have mm. you have a technical commentary. Yes. You have a pastoral commentary, and you have a devotional commentary. And a lot of people struggle because they go out and they buy a technical commentary that's dealing with the Hebrew and the Greek language, and they're dealing with nuances within a language. And so a lot of the commentary is written in Hebrew or Greek, and you have someone who knows nothing about Hebrew or Greek, who just wants to learn the Bible. They go out and they buy a technical commentary, and now they're trying to read it, and they're struggling, and they get discouraged. So if you have a little knowledge of Greek, I know a little Greek. He's about four foot two. <laughs> but, um, but, That's about how tall I am. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have a little knowledge of Greek and Hebrew, and even if you don't, but you're an a, a avid studier, they can be helpful because they do deal in English with a lot of the nuances of the text. But then there's other ones called technical slash pastoral. And those are good because they bring application now. So technical commentaries won't have any application where pastoral commentaries will have. So there's a pastoral commentary that's written in English, John MacArthur's other people, um, uh, Kent Hughes, you know, these are pastor, these are like sermons they've preached and they're explaining the text. So you have then devotional, devotional commentaries maybe take one verse and they're more devotional. There's no deep meat there. It's just more encouragement. So you, it's good to, like, if you're studying the book of Timothy, yes. have a uh, uh, technical commentary, 
have a technical slash pastoral or a pastoral commentary and a devotional commentary. So now you have three commentaries, you're studying one book and you're getting different nuances and understanding of the text from different views. And so as you move along with, you know, different commentators, sometimes it's also good to have an understanding about what their theological background is too, because that's Correct. going to slant the way yeah. that they're making a comment. So for instance, John MacArthur is a dispensational reformed right and so, so what does that mean steve well dispensationalism is an eschatology it's a view end time view and it actually came about really in the 1800s yeah the, uh, john nelson darby so it's new it is new and it, i like new. now historic pre it's premillennial yes so all dispensationalists are premillennialists but, but not all premillennialists are dispensationalists say that ten times real fast yeah and for some of our uh, Audience, they might not understand this, but so John MacArthur believes kind of like the Left Behind series, but he's a moderate dispensationalist. He believes that Israel still has a place. There's still going to be a, a thousand year physical, literal millennial reign where there's going to be Christ coming and ruling and reigning on the earth in a thousand year Jewish millennial. Um, I'm a millennial. We believe that a millennial is a figurative, uh, 1,000 year reign is figurative between the first and second comings of Christ. There's different views, but you, you just have to understand the person that you read a commentary, he's going to put his views into how he interprets. And certain he's passages. not doing it secretly. He's, no, no, he's no. very upfront about yeah. where his position is. And so read it, but I'm telling you, you're going to see a little nuance there. Accept it and say, okay, that's why he thinks that. Yeah. Oh, amen. I'm yeah, good with that. It colors the way you, he interprets something. So you have to understand the author that you're reading is in Armenian. Is he a Lutheran? Is he reformed? Is he a charismatic? Is he a cessationist? However you're reading him, his view is going to permeate through his his commentary. And so you have to understand that not everything he says is actually correct. It's just his interpretation. Yes. Yes. And so once again, we're going to put some of these on our webpage. It won't be an exhaustive list by any means, but we'll try to share the two, the few nuggets that we know about and put it out there so you can benefit from some of the resources, at least some of the ones that we like. Well, we went over investigation, interpretation. The third one is implementation. Right, it's another way of saying application. The most important part to me, I think. <laughs> well, yeah, and some people kind of jump from reading to applying, but they don't ever actually interpret anything, and that's majorly problematic. So, uh, how does this point to the gospel? How does this point to the person of Jesus Christ? How can you apply that which you've learned from the interpretation that you came up with? And again, that interpretation could be wrong. You want to get to a right interpretation, so then you can implement it properly. And at times we have to cross what the book Grasping God's Word calls the principalizing bridge. And so in other words, can we take something from the Old Testament? We're not in the exact same situation as we as in the Old Testament now, but could there possibly be a principle that we carry over from the Old into the New Testament? So for instance, we don't have temples any we don't have a temple anymore. And so things that apply to doing things inside the temple, can we take some of those principles and bring them over into New Testament covenant? Because remember, there's two covenants. There was an old covenant and new covenant. And so we have to realize these kinds of things. Okay, so we've looked at the three steps of biblical interpretation. Hopefully you memorize those. Hopefully you implement those uh, because... Hearing about it is not enough. We have to do what we learn to the glory of God. Now, let's continue actually looking at different verses and Christian cliches. So this one would be more categorized as a Christian cliche rather than a Bible verse, but many... Wait, wait, wait. Phil, cliche and you don't go together. <laughs> That's an Come inside on. joke, people. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, how many people have heard this uh, quoted before? Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. There you go. That cliche is so bad. It's so bad. Oh. All right. Well, let's figure out why it's bad, and, and because it sounds really good, and a lot of people utilize it. So do you know who this quote is normally attributed to? 
Some sissy? A yeah. sissy or something? St. Francis the sissy. Oh, okay. No, St. Francis. Bronx version. That's the Bronx version. That's my favorite saint. St. <laughs> Francis of Assisi, and he was the founder of the Franciscan order of Roman Catholicism. Yet, no one is sure if Francis ever actually said this, because it doesn't show up in any of his writings. Some use his words in the rule of 1221, chapter 12, on how the Franciscans should practice their preaching, which reads as follows. No brother should preach contrary to the form and regulations of the Holy Church, nor unless he has been permitted by his minister, all the friars should preach by their deeds. However, let's address the quote itself and the problems with it. So we can't find this in any of his writings, so it's null and void in that respect. However, since so many people use it, let's address the problem with the quote itself, because you wouldn't tell children, bathe regularly, and if necessary, use water, (laughs) right? Or let's say you had a mercy ministry, and you said, feed starving children, and if necessary, use food. So- you mean when you watch the evening news, they're not doing pantomime? No, no. And, and also, I mean, that that's impossible. We're sinners still. Absolutely. So the quote is intended to say that proclaiming the gospel by example is somehow more virtuous than actually proclaiming it with words by using your voice. That's absolutely ridiculous. It's absurd. And you know uh, who's using this mantra over and over? It's a darling of the social gospel activists, which is high in the hog right now, especially in the Southern Baptist Convention. Isn't it, Steve? Yes, Another podcast. <laughs> Definitely another podcast. Yes. So this quote is is wielded to poke fun at zealous evangelists, to poke them in the eye and rebrand social work as a form of evangelism. So people like Rick Warren and Jim Wallace and others uh, use this passage and people like Tony Campolo to try to get us to do and mow people's lawns and other such things so that people will look at us and say, man, I wonder why Steve Langella, why that nice guy is mowing my lawn. What makes you so different? Why can't he mow my lawn? Yeah. Because I'm a Muslim. Muslim. <laughs> That's right. Don't Muslims do good work? Yeah, absolutely. They do good deeds, quote unquote. Um, and so there's like a winsome ring of truth to the idea that my lifestyle can be a testimony or proclamation of God's saving work. But the problem is it creates a dichotomy between what we do, our orthodoxy and our orthopraxy, or between speech and action, between those who practice the gospel or to or said to be more faithful than those who preach the gospel. What are some problems with this, guys? Well, a lot, because how is somebody going to know that the wrath of God is upon them by me trimming their roses? (laughs) (laughs) That's, you know. Badly, because I don't think he's really talented. It's not in the thorns, Steve, (laughs) somehow. I'm supposed to realize you're trimming my roses or the thorns. the, The good news of the gospel can't be really preached until the bad news is understood. Absolutely. Because good news is not good news if there's no bad news. So, Steve, Glenn, Steve. You're, you're a big political guy, right? Yeah. What, what's your uh, what's your news of choice you watch? I mean, I'd watch Fox News. I, okay. Know, yeah. So, imagine on Fox News, people are behind the scenes in the camera, right? And so, they're just moving around, and they're just kind of doing things. They're not saying anything. There's no words popping up on the screen. Do they have orange hair? <laughs> I'll get it. I'll Possibly. Get it. All right. right? Are you supposed to decipher everything that's happening in the world just through seeing people moving around on the screen? Are you going to figure that out? I'm going to say no. You're going to say no. News has to come in either one of two ways. Either it has to be written so you read the news or it has to be spoken. You hear the news. So how can we preach the gospel without speaking or without writing and reading? How well, is that supposed well, to come? Well, let's get to the heart of it. The, the, Bring it what to the you heart, really brother. use that for is it's hard to say it. It's hard to tell people, like you said, that you're going to hell. It's hard to say that you're a sinner. It, it, it's very controversial to get up out in the street and say, you, you know, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's so much easier to just kind of be a nice guy and people to ask you, hey, why are you so smiling all the time? Cut the rose bushes, mow right. the lawn. It's a way to be a Christian without the stigma. Now, here's the thing. Doing good deeds, does that open a door for us to preach the gospel to people? It can. It can. It yeah, may it means. may or may not. It's true. But 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 they're saying 
that the primary way is to do good deeds, not as a means to preach the gospel. That right. you don't even need to preach it. They're saying By that loving is preaching them. The showing gospel. love to them is preaching the gospel. No, no. it's not. It's just showing no. love to them. No. And it's not real love because you didn't tell them that you're going to burn an eternal hellfire. Yeah. So I remember when I did some homeless ministry somewhere um, in Manhattan. And I remember we gave this guy toiletries and blankets and uh, he seemed to be very grateful. And I said, listen, I'd like to do two things before I leave. I'd like to pray with you. And he was okay with that. And I said, I'd like to share the gospel with you. And I began to share the gospel with him. Man, he cussed me up, right, down, center, left and right, diagonal, in directions I don't even know. Did you take the stuff back? (laughs) No, I left him with the stuff. But, you know, he was okay with getting the stuff, but he didn't want the gospel. There's actually, like... Pastor Peter and I did the same thing. We went up there to submissions. And because they get federal funding, they're not, you're not even supposed to say the gospel to them. Right. Who's, you're supposed to give it to them and, and just kind of let because you can't infringe on them. The reason why you're doing it is because God saved you to love your brothers, but you can't mention that. So who is Peter? You keep saying Peter for our audience. Oh, Pastor Peter is the, the pastor of Grace Baptist. We have two elders, Pastor Phil and Pastor Peter. So Pastor Phil is sitting right next to us. Yes. He's in this podcast with us. So I like to refer to the other pastor when, when saying anything pastoral. There you go. So Phil, <laughs> why do they call you, you call yourself sensei? Well, yeah, I think you gave me that name, actually. Did I? <laughs> why did I give you that name? Well, I like to teach. What do you teach, though? I teach the Word of God. But what else did you do? Okay, I teach martial arts as well. Okay, <laughs> Self-defense, so people can get up on their, everybody is kung fu fighting. And, and my nickname came from me chiseling words on, on granite. Yes, no. I'm a bec- wordsmith. You are wordsmith because you're always hitting delete and correcting my uh, my books that I'm writing. <laughs> so you have to preach the gospel with words. Yes, you have to preach the gospel with words. Um, because it's a message. It is a message. And it's about what... The gospel is about how God fixed my marriage and gave me joy and peace and I was depressed and God made me happy, right? Negative, because there is a lady that I met and when she came to know Christ, her husband tried to kill her with a butcher knife several times because he was a Muslim and he had many of the men on the front cover of Time Magazine when 9-11 took place. So the gospel that flooded her heart ended up if you will, screwing up her marriage because he hated Christ and he tried to butcher his wife to death and thank God that she's still alive and she's alive in Christ, which is even all the more. So, so I would say preach the gospel using words from the Bible and, and, and live it out. Yeah. So Romans chapter 10 verse 14 shows us a preacher is needed. Paul never said, how will they see without a preacher? He said, how will they hear without a preacher. And Romans ten seventeen says, faith comes not by seeing, but by hearing the word of Christ. Not you're just seeing actions. And, and even in Romans, you just mentioned, the, the idea is that fact that you're going out in a street corner and preaching, the fact that you're walking up to a stranger and yes. preaching, the fact that you're telling your loved ones, I care about you, this is what's going to happen if you don't do this, that is the action. That's the seeing part of it in conjunction with the words. Not... The action with no words. It's, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah. Paul said again in Second Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 5, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, which requires speaking, rebuke, which requires speaking, and exhort, which requires speaking. Well, you, you can exhort with your hands. So I'm just letting you know. <laughs> well, I'm Italian, so we do that a lot. Yeah, my dad used to exhort with his hands. So when in doubt. Spanking. When in doubt, use words. And right? my mom, too, with the belt. <laughs> my father, you want some exhortation? I'll show you a beat. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, with complete patience and teaching. So teaching requires speaking. These are all indicative of using Words And then he continues, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away many from listening to the truth and wander off in the midst, speaking, speaking, speaking. So if we have the wrong people speaking all day long, right, we have so many wrong voices out there, if you will, how do we get the truth into people's hearts and ears, we speak. Well, that's the danger, right? If we are showing and not speaking, someone's going to fill the void. Absolutely. There'll that's be a the vacuum. Problem. That's the main There'll problem be a vacuum. with that quote. So, Steve, are we downplaying actions? 
Not at all. Because we're called to do good works. And our good works are not really for God. They're for our neighbor. Yes. So we want to do, do good to all. The Bible says to do good to all. And so if I'm going to preach the gospel to someone and I'm a jerk to them, you think they're going to listen to me? Probably not. Probably not. That's but why I don't I'm, listen to you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I listen to you. But if I'm kind to them and I'm showing them love and mercy and just being considerate. Yes. Right. And, and helping out and doing things. That's going to open a door for me to be able to preach the gospel because then they're going to say, okay, you actually live out what you say, so maybe I'll listen. Yeah. yeah. Not all the time. Sometimes they don't want to hear nothing. Right. But if you're being a jerk and you're not helping people out and they just feel like you're preaching to them and not caring about them, they don't want to hear the message. Yeah. So Matthew 5, 16 and 17 says, let your light show shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. And I remember- How are they going to know it's your father if you don't tell them? <laughs> They're just supposed to like read it on my forehead, you know, have the mark. No, but I remember when I was just a teenager and I was like the ignorant evangelist, if you will. I had no idea what sharing the gospel was really. And But I remember um, I would speak a lot about the things of God and one of my teachers yelled at me to stay after class and I had no idea what I did wrong. I, I I was convinced I didn't do anything wrong. And what he said to me was, he said, I'm Jewish and I'm getting divorced and I'm at the end of my rope and God seems real with you. Would you pray for me? Mm. So somehow, I, I don't know, um, I, I, I don't ever remember like preaching the gospel to him per se, but... He knew you were a Christian. Yeah, he knew I was a Christian. Well, I mean, I would write about the gospel in his assignments, and Christ was in my assignments when I would write papers and things like that. I always brought scripture into my papers, so he knew in, in that regards. But I never like preached directly to him. But um, I don't know. Maybe I was kind to him or whatever. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like this quote had a lot of good intentions, and we've just abused it. You know, it, it, I think it's supposed to be ironic, you know, like, hey, don't go around preaching if you're not going to live this life out. And we took that to mean we don't got to preach, <laughs> you know, and I, and I, and it, it could be very beautiful the way it's, it's phrased. It's meant to say, hey, you know, live it out. Okay. So I, I want you guys right now to address our audience with, without words. <laughs> <laughs> It's impossible. Right, right. Yeah. It's one, absurd. Yeah, one preacher said- I don't said, think we would have a lot of listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that podcast? Stop and Is think it about it. Is it still on? It's, it's just amazing. stop. <laughs> it's just- it's, It would just be stop. What did you hear? I heard the sound of silence. How about, no, we have a podcast called Think About It, <laughs> but we're not going to say anything. We yeah, just want you, you to- We just want you to think. To hear our still small voice. <laughs> so one preacher said, preach the gospel- if necessary, rebuke anyone who says, if necessary, use words. <laughs> amen, amen. So on the vein of, of cl cliches, right? I know one that drives me crazy. We all use it. We've all abused this. Second Philippians. Are you judging uh, me? Uh, Second sorry. Philippians? <laughs> no, I, I, I was wrong. I mean, third Philippians. Okay. Um, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things mm. through Christ who strengthens me. Boxing matches, MMA fights, soccer games. You know, the, that 10th that hour you're on that video game, you can just do it. Just you know, it, They use it as a motivational tool. I can body slam you for Jesus in the ring. <laughs> yeah, so it's like for winning a race, for mastering an instrument, for passing a test. You know, And I've heard well-meaning, mature Christians tell younger believers who are going to have to do a test, you can do all things through Christ's strength. Can I just ask you a quick question? Sure. What if you have, let's say there's uh, a Christian on the Mets and a Christian on the Yankees, and they're both clinging to that verse to win the game? Um, yeah, so, I mean, look, we. I hope we all know that it's talking about enduring persecution, that we can endure anything this world can throw at us and still preach the gospel. But how would you know that, Glenn? Well, I read in the context, you know, instead of starting at verse 13, let's start at verse four and five and six. So I'll read so some So you it. don't just rip it out of the context to make it say, how are you going to put it out on a tattoo on your uh, arm when you play football? <laughs> you got to write it in really small letters, right? To get it all on there because you got to get context. Um, so Philippians four, right? It talks off. I I'm not even going to go all the way to the beginning. I'm going to just go a couple verses ahead. Verses five, uh, four and five. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I send, rejoice. 
Verse 5, let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. So it's talking about rejoicing in all situations, right? Verse 6 and 7, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Once again, be careful for nothing. Worry about nothing in that sense. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus. It's talking about the situation, what's happening to you, and not necessarily a supernatural power that you're going to do something with. Now, let's get to the immediate context of verse 11 and 12. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therefore, to be content, whatever state I am in. Verse 12, I know both, and this is Paul talking about you know, in context of persecution, all the things he's went through. I know how to be abased, which means to be low, and I know how to abound, which means to be up. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed to be both full and to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer need. So whether I'm in having a great day or a bad day, right? Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, which strengthens me. Let me ask you a question. That gives me the power to hit a home run. Who who wrote this? Uh, the, well, this is written through the the, the God breathed Holy Spirit by Paul. Right. So yeah. Paul wrote this, and where was Paul when he wrote this? Wasn't he playing soccer? No, he was. was it, did they have soccer back then in prison? I think he was in uh, a gladiator match at the time, <laughs> right? He was <laughs> yeah, throwing he was, the Kimura on somebody. He yeah, he was in prison. He was locked up. So he was in prison. Yeah. So. That piece of information is huge. So now when you read this passage with that in mind, and he says, I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content, he's writing that he's content in prison being persecuted for Christ. You don't think you don't mean you don't think he's saying that God is going to strengthen him to break out of prison. That's no, not what he's saying. No. Okay. God is not going to make him like Samson and he's going to like bend the bars back and he's going to like slip out. I mean, how can you read this knowing all the things that happened to the apostles? <laughs> but maybe- what happened to the God to Christ himself? Yeah, he's brought low and he knows how to abound. So in every situation, and this is a situation, he's sitting in jail. Would you and I like to be in that situation? Absolutely not. No. Would we would we say rejoice again? Rejoice and again I say rejoice while we're sitting in prison. No, so we, that, we, 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 but see, that's the con, that's the application of the verse. Amen. Yes. Paul yeah. could rejoice in prison because he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. Even rejoice. Exactly. Right. Man. Right, you make me want to get saved all over right. again. Right, so, so the word, so the words are state. You know, it 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 it, it 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 tells you. Now, if you just go to verse thirteen, you can make it whatever you want. Sure. And, and I look, I'm, and I'm cherry pick. I'm even cherry picking verses in here. But the whole start from Philippians one, chapter one, verse one. You cannot get that from reading the book of Philippians. So a college student has to take an exam and doesn't really study, but says, you know what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Except I have for stu- done that. Except for study for my exam. I have done that. <laughs> I have, or, or I study and say, I'm going to remember what I studied because Christ can strengthen me. I've done that. I've had people tell me to do that. Right. So Christ, we have to realize the emphasis is on Christ, not on what I can do right. or not do. And he is strengthening people to do his will, not their own will. So yeah, if I so- want to climb a wall or a rock wall and that's my will, right? And, uh, and I have a bad hip, so maybe I shouldn't do that. You know, he might not strengthen me for that because he doesn't want me to do that per se. It's like the opposite of the still small voice. Still small voice, we're supposed to be listening for what God wants us to do. In this one, whatever you want to do, God's going to co sign that. <laughs> He's going to give me the energy to get it done. And so people use that for career advancements. Right. Right. For, for winning games, mm-hmm. for wrestling matches, for everything but what, it, what it's really meant for. Amen. It's for persevering. To the end, persevering exactly. in faithfulness to the gospel. Paul was a minister of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Woman to me if I don't preach the gospel. Amen. In prison, Paul is preaching to the guys who are handcuffed to him, 
who are tied to him. Yeah. His whole life is ministry. So he can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in prison, what is he doing? He's writing letters to encourage Christians who are struggling. Amen, amen. And he's not strengthening himself, right? Right, right. He, he's, he's not getting like this buff faith, you know, pulling himself by his own spiritual bootstraps, as Steve Langella would often say. It's Christ who's giving him the strength to do the things that are in, that are literally impossible because how do you live the life of the apostle Paul unless God is strengthening you? And another uh, application for Paul would be he prayed three times that the Lord would remove this thorn in the flesh and God said, my grace is sufficient. So that's yeah. God strengthening him. Strengthening him. Amen. Yeah, because Steve, I remember when you preached, you spoke about Paul. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. And just the litany of his life. Stoned. Stoned. Not the kind that people do today. Beaten with rods. Yeah. Left yeah. And, for dead. And who was strengthening him to endure every beating and every hardship the whole time? It was Christ who was strengthening him. So the preceding verse says in verse 14, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. Yes. Yeah, so, th- so, so he's acknowledging that he had trouble. Hey, I'm struggling. This is difficult, but God has strengthened me through this process. Thank you for caring about the difficulties that I had. Yeah. And he's it encouraging them yeah. in the process because how can he tell them to endure if he's not enduring? And they all know where he is because the letter is coming from jail to them. So we need to realize that Christ strengthens us for things according to his will. But another verse that we have that I know Steve is itching to share is what verse, Steve? Second Peter 3.9. Not Second Peter 3.9. Second Peter 3.9. <laughs> okay. So a lot of people struggle with this. They say that Jesus came to save everybody. That means every single person that ever lived without distinction. So when Jesus died on the cross, did he die for the people that were already in hell when he died? We that, at, that counts as everybody. That would count as everyone. Or as Vody Bachman would say, everybody. That's everybody, beyond everybody. everybody. So let's look at 2 Peter 3, 9, and let's look at what it says. I'm going, I'm going to just read the verse out of context so we can understand how people read it. That's the best way to read it. Right. <laughs> 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So people say, see, God wants everyone to come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to perish. And so Jesus came to die for everyone. Well, yeah, the verse says that if you pull it out of its context. But when you read the verse in its context, I believe it says something completely different. So listen, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward the world. No. But is patient toward you, not wishing that anyone in the world should perish. You. No. Not that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. All who? Well, who are they? Well, if we back up to verse 8, he says this, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that Mm. with the Lord, one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. So the you that he's addressing in verse 8, he calls them beloved. Well, who are the beloved? Well, if we go back to the beginning of the chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. Now, Peter's addressing a group of people that he calls beloved. And in verse 8, he says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved. In verse 9, he's saying, God is patient towards you, beloved, not wishing that any of who? The beloved should perish, but that all of who? All of the beloved that he's addressing should come to repentance. So then, who are these people he's speaking to? Yeah, that's got to be the bride of Christ. Well, listen. He says in verse one, now this is the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. He's writing to the same people he wrote to in the first letter. If he's writing a second letter to a group of people called beloved, how do we find out who they are? There had to be a first letter. We go back to the first letter. And if we go back to first Peter one, one, listen to how Peter addresses his audience. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are, here we go, elect 
exiles of the dispersion. That's the beloved. So the beloved that Peter is addressing in the second chapter are the people that he called the elect of the first chapter. Wow. So now if we take that word elect and understand that Peter is addressing a people, he's saying, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, elect, beloved. And in verse 8, but do not overlook this one fact, elect or beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, beloved, the elect, not wishing that any of the beloved or elect should perish, but that all of the beloved and the elect should reach Repentance. So let me ask you a question, Steve. Who did God, because it says to fulfill his promise, who did God make his promise to? To his people. He didn't make it to everybody in the world? No. Because God breaks his promises, right? Can God break his promise? Never. So when God makes a promise, he always keeps it. Matter of fact, I believe it is in Genesis chapter 15, when God made his covenant with Abraham, God swore by himself because he could not swear to anything higher because there is no higher authority than himself. So when God makes a promise, he makes a promise to his promised people. So what's the point here? What is God's delay? Is it he's slow or is that God is waiting because there are other elect people that the gospel needs to go to and these people will also come? So Paul says, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. So God is being kind. It says he's being patient because right. he's still pulling and calling people unto himself that he's already elected from before the foundation of the world and he's still bringing about the means and situations and circumstances in their life to where they will come and be drawn to his irresistible grace and be counted among the beloved. And so God's patient is mercy towards the elect because there are elect out there, Paul said in Acts, when he was in Corinth, he said, Paul, do not be afraid. I have many people in this city. And yet there was no gospel preached in the city yet. Who are these people? They were unsaved, unregenerate people that God chose before the foundation of the world that would come to Christ through the preaching of Paul. And God already called them my people. Wow. So as we looked at all these verses, we learned one thing. You can't rightly interpret a verse until you follow the three rules of interpretation. Context, Google, context, and context. Oh, okay. Right? No Google. Because when you rip it out of its context, oh yeah, all means all. Yeah. But in its context, all is addressed to the specific group called beloved or elect. Right. It's and like so saying the whole city came out uh, for the ticker tape parade when the Yankees won because the Mets often don't win, right? Just <laughs> 1986. But um all that came out were everyone who came out of their apartment, but not everybody came out to the parade to celebrate the Yankees winning yet again. Many people stayed inside. Exactly. So the all was just the people on the streets. And, and, so and, as Glenn would say, to wrap it in a bow. Yeah. Yes. Don't let up studying God's word and rightly handling the word of truth. We need to be like the Bereans who studied to see if even what Paul was saying was true. So if you need some resources or you want to further discuss this, please feel free to email us at stopandthinkcrew at gmail.com. That's stopandthinkcrew at gmail.com. And we just want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to this podcast. All our friends and foes, saints and sinners, may we rightly divide and handle the word of truth. If you would like to contact us, please email us at stopandthinkcrew at gmail.com. You can also visit our website at www.stopandthinkpodcast.com. This podcast is listener supported by generous people like you. You can give a tax deductible donation at our affiliate ministry at www.soulfishyministries.org and click on our donate link to give securely through PayPal. Thank you for listening to Stop and Think About It.